The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. If you would remain standing for the reading of the Word, the passage this morning is Isaiah chapter 52. I'll be reading verses 7 through 10. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. With their voices they shall sing together. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together. Your waste places of you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted His people; He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare His holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall, shall see the salvation of our God. Now, since the reading of God's word, you may be seated. We are not much familiar with messengers these days, uh, except instant messenger and text and email. Uh, we hardly get any, even send letters uh, anymore. Uh, and so most of what the uh, uh, post office delivers is not first class mail. You don't, you rarely, if ever, get a, and certainly not a handwritten letter uh, from anyone. And those that look like the uh, handwriting on the envelope, uh, uh, you know that there's some sort of uh, plea for funds. Um, but we're not used to messengers. Uh, and particular, uh, particularly, we're not used to messengers in the sense in which Isaiah speaks here, where you see a messenger coming. Uh, and you know, this is a, a familiar passage, and perhaps we don't think about it. It's too familiar. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. It's an odd picture, an odd image. But if you think about it for a bit, I, the image is perhaps not that odd because the messenger is far enough away that you can't see his face you get just sort of a vague impression of someone coming. But how do you know it's someone coming? Because his feet are moving. And so you look and you hope perhaps this is good news. There's a curious passage in Second Samuel 18. If you recall, this is the conclusion of, the, of Absalom's rebellion. Uh, Joab has just put uh, Absalom to death. And uh, we shift scenes to David. We, D Joab has this conversation with uh, a couple of men as to who's going to bear the news to David that Absalom is dead. And then we shift our scene to, uh, to David. Now David was sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate. Another curious parallel. The watchman on the roof, David on the roof, overlooking Bathsheba. And it's this death of Absalom, and all this rebellion is the fruit of that one on the roof overlooking, lifted his eyes and looked, and there was a man running alone. Then the watchman cried out and told the king, and the king said, If he is alone, there is news in his mouth. And he came rapidly and drew near. <clears throat> then the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called to the gatekeeper and said, There is another man running alone. And the king said, He also brings news. So the watchman said, I think the running of the first is like the running of Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok. Uh, you're probably more familiar with the, uh, uh, the assertion of the watchman saying, the, it's got to be Jehu coming because he drives like a madman. 
But here he sees him and he says, it runs like a hemiaz. It may not be a hemiaz, but it sure runs like him. And the king said, he is a good man and comes with good news. So Ahimeaz called out and said to the king, All is well. Actually, what he said was shalom, peace. Then he bowed down with his face to the earth before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord your God, who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my lord the king. And we'll leave that story at that point because we all know the end of it. David's lamentation over the death of Absalom and Joab's rebuke of him. But I, I wanted to draw our attention to that story because there are a number of verbal parallels between it and the passage that we just read in Isaiah 52. In 2 Samuel 18, we have the messenger running identified by his feet, as it were, as a hemiaz, bringing a message. And his message was to announce the death of a son. Here, but when he came, what did he proclaim? He proclaimed shalom. Now we move a couple of hundred years into the future from David's time and we hear the voice of Isaiah saying how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. It's that same word of bringing news that we see that we saw in the second Samuel passage who proclaims shalom, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation. Once again the image of a runner, a messenger coming running, bringing good news, bringing news of peace and of salvation. And his proclamation is to Zion, your God reigns. Now, most of you have heard me say at one time or another that one of the interesting things, when Jesus begins to preach, he proclaims the gospel of the kingdom. He says the kingdom of God is at hand. And a very curious thing is that phrase, kingdom of God, is nowhere appears in the Old Testament. But we have on many occasions, uh, Psalms 90, uh, 92 through uh, 100, for example, your God reigns, the Lord reigns, the Lord is king. And that's the message of the messenger who proclaims shalom, who proclaims salvation. Your God reigns, and in that reigning of God is indeed our salvation. And then we have the watchman, same kind of watchman as from 2 Samuel 18. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. They're the ones perched on top of the wall, looking out, keeping an eye out for the messenger coming and awaiting the message that he's going to bring. And they receive the message, and with their voices they shall sing together, for they shall see plainly when the Lord brings back Zion. It will be clear to them. The uh, uh, literal translation there is that for they shall see eye to eye, but in our idiom, eye to eye implies just agreement. But rather the idiom is that they will see clearly, they will see plainly when the Lord brings back Zion. And so they will break forth into joy and sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. That's the news that has come. That's the news that provokes them to joy, that provokes them into singing and rejoicing, even the waste places of Jerusalem. And here, obviously, the language uh, of Jerusalem, the language of Zion is not intended to be primarily with reference to the physical place uh, over in Palestine, uh, but the reference to the people of God among whom he dwells that he has redeemed his people, he has comforted his people. And how has he comforted his people? 
He has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And all of the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And we read that and we think, second coming. And we think Jesus appearing in the clouds with the heavenly host. And every eye shall see him. And every knee shall bow and shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And certainly, that's part of the picture here. That's part of what's being proclaimed. But it's interesting to me that Paul takes us back a little further. Not looking with this passage so much to the end of times, to the restoration of all things, but rather in Isaiah or in Romans chapter 10, how shall they how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. What is Paul referring to there? He's preaching. He's referring to the preaching of the gospel. And how does he define that as he writes to the church in Corinth? Again, a familiar passage. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. The gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And so the, the feet running over the mountains, bringing good news, proclaiming Shalom, proclaiming salvation, bringing good tidings of good things, are once again announcing the death of a son. But this time, not a son who died in an act of rebellion against his father, (coughs) but a son who said, your will, not mine. And God has called out watchmen. He's called out messengers to rejoice and to proclaim the message. That's Paul's point there in Romans chapter 10. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe if they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? We were reminded yesterday in chapel of the importance of our proclaiming the gospel to all and sundry and trusting God to bear fruit where he will. But we are called as watchmen. We are called as messengers. We are the ones who are called to proclaim shalom, to proclaim salvation, to bring glad tidings of good things. Your God reigns and he reigns in the death and burial and resurrection of his son the Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations now again our minds probably quickly go to 
the idea of the second coming, the appearance of Jesus Christ in power and in glory. But in the, and certainly that's part of what's in view here. But more particularly, I think what is in view here is that in the death of His Son, the Lord has bared His holy arm. And it was done not in a corner, not in a hiding place, but before a watching world. The ends of the earth. Imagine all of the people gathered from all over the Roman Empire to celebrate Passover that week in Jerusalem. The power of God laid bare in weakness. And again, the point that Paul makes as he writes to the Corinthians who are all about power and wisdom and impressive things. Where where Paul says, where's the wise, where's the scribe, where's the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. We are called to be messengers. We are called to be watchmen. We are called to be those making our voices heard, lifting up our voices, having seen plainly the Lord's restoration of Zion. We now proclaim that to a world that will hear as God gives ears to hear, but they can't hear without a preacher. Now we tend to think of missions as foreign missions. Dr. Kurto in Uganda. Uh, Others uh, in various other places, uh, former graduates uh, of ours in in Belgium. Others in other places in in, uh, Brazil, in uh, uh, just other places throughout the world. And we tend to think... Uh, Well, another way of putting it is we tend to think of missions as perhaps everything that's not the U.S. and Canada and Western Europe. That's what missions involves. On any given Sunday, about 1% of the population of Japan is in church. That's any church. On any given Sunday, about 2% of the population of the UK is in church. That's any church. Now the percentages are higher here in the United States. The percentages are perhaps higher in many places in Latin America and in Brazil, but most of those churches are Roman churches that teach a gospel that is no gospel. The, and even here in the States with its higher church attendance, how many of those churches are churches that put on big show and then tell you to try harder to do better this week? Where a crucified Savior is as much foolishness 
as it was to first century Greeks. The mission is out there. The mission is wherever God calls you to go. You're a messenger. You are messengers assigned to proclaim good news. You are watchmen set up upon the wall to watch and to proclaim to those waiting what that news is. And that news is the Lord has comforted His people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. He has made bare His holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God, but they won't see it if we don't go and proclaim it. They won't hear it if we don't go and preach it. They won't believe it if our words are not heard. And so, today, as you consider your calling, as you consider where God might have you be His messenger, where God might have you be His watchman, where God might place you proclaiming the gospel of a crucified, risen Savior. Just remember who you are. You're a messenger of God. You're a preacher of the gospel. Do it boldly, the way the watchman on the wall would. Do it boldly, the way the messenger running back from the field of battle with a message would. Don't do it with fear. Don't do it with trembling. Do it with boldness in the power of the Spirit. Because all our labor is in vain unless it's done in the power of the Spirit. We could stand and preach ourselves blue in the face. But unless the Spirit works with the Word, it's just noise. But He's promised. And beg His promises. Don't be satisfied to serve in a church that is purer and purer, but smaller and smaller. Look to serve in a context where your preaching brings people to repentance and faith because they've heard the gospel faithfully preached. They've heard the glad tidings of good things. They have heard peace with God proclaimed. They have heard the word of salvation. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would give us beautiful feet. That we would be messengers running eagerly with a joyous message of a restored and comforted people. Restored and comforted by a crucified and risen Savior. Help us to seek to be faithful, to proclaim fearlessly and boldly that our God reigns. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.